long story short is by the end of it, after a month, I'm actually okay with spiders now. Like normal yeah. size spiders. Amazing. Fun. This was a, this is immersion therapy. This is like literal yeah. immersion therapy to get rid of phobia and it works. Yep. So anybody out there afraid of spiders, all you have to do is go to Australia, spend a lot of time under a rusted out ute in a field and let the spiders crawl over you until you're you're better. All right, welcome to the Autopian Podcast. I'm David Tracy. I'm here just north of Detroit. There's Jason Torchinsky in a dank, dark basement. So dank. And, and we have Bo Bachman in a beautiful Aston Martin showroom there. Yeah. What's that behind you, uh, Bo? It's uh, it's the F1 edition Vantage. Beautiful car. It's Absolutely great to be here. Jason, I have a question for you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. What, what do you call someone whose job it is to write things down for someone? Like a not a stenographer. That's specific. Scribe. Someone, or like yes, Bo. Scribe. Yes. What would you call someone? What would you call someone who is just below mm. a, a scribe? A scribble. A subscribe. There you know, it is. Oh, oh, subscribe. that is bad. That's, David. that's actually a really good point to bring up because everybody should be subscribing to this podcast. You know, Dave, I just got off the phone with we'll the, the uh, animal shelter the here. Oh. And they've promised me for everybody who subscribes, a kitten or puppy won't be put down. Oh, wow. You know that? That's a and wonderful actually, thing. It's a wonderful. And I think they're going to take that nationally to all local animal shelters. So, so subscribe. Do the like thing. Have, Do if the you right have thing. Apple, if you have Apple, Google, Spotify or Stitcher. Stitcher. Um, Stitcher AOL. 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 If you're using AOL, I'm pretty sure we're big on AOL as well. <laughs> Netscape, Netscape Communicator. We're big fans yeah. of that, too. All of these places. Yeah. The source CompuServe. All of these places are places you can subscribe to our podcast, and you should. Why wouldn't you do that? There's no okay. all right. To all right. Subscribe to anymore. You got to subscribe to something, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All and right. So t- yeah. today, you should also come to our website, David. I think oh, too. We have a great website for those who may, might not know. It's really the fantastic. Utopian. You guys kick ass. It, oh, <laughs> you're, you're a peach. It's full of good stuff, though, and people really owe it to themselves to to, to join it. I think. Yeah, I agree. Okay, go to the Autopia.com. Enough of that. Today's podcast, uh, we've got we've got some exciting guests. These guys Uh, are amazing, by the way. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, If you're into Japanese cars, you have to listen today. If you're into weird collector cars, oh my gosh, you're in for a treat. Oh, these guys. Oh, I can't wait. Legendary. In in the automotive geek community, I I would say these are these are legendary people we're we're gonna be talking to. Absolutely. I sold one of my cars to this to this person, one of the people we're talking to. Wow. That's how big a deal it is. So get ready for that. Until then, let's talk about some of the best performing stories on the Autopian. Should we have said their names? <laughs> that would have been a good idea. Oh. Let's say their names of the people who are coming. It is Myron Vernus. <laughs> and Mark Brinker. Mark you know, Brinker. Did... Why didn't we say their names? But you know, Aaron <laughs> Vernis and Mark Brinker. Suspense, that's why. I yeah. thought you were being suspenseful, Jason. No, I realized we, we I just realized we uh, we didn't. We should though. And we did. <laughs> All right. Moving on. I'm glad this is a podcast where you can't really see me because I look like absolute hell. Um, I just got back from Australia a few days ago. Actually, it was like five days ago, and I still the 14 hour time difference has still screwed me up pretty badly. Um, it's brutal, right? I mean, I'm still messed up. That was 10 days ago. I got back. So yeah, it's nuts. No, oh, yeah. well, welcome back, David. You look great. Oh, shucks. Yeah. Thank you. Good to have you back. No, I'm, I'm glad to be back. Um, we're going to talk about a story I published the other day that actually, you know, more people read this story than I expected. The headline was what it's like fixing cars infested with the world's biggest spiders. I don't think that's surprising at all. I feel like right? that, why wouldn't you click on that? The world's biggest spiders is something that I feel like everybody's going to click on. That doesn't surprise me one bit. This is absolutely a horrifying story, by the way, just just <laughs> just, to, just to throw it in there. And you are a very brave man. I'm, I'm very proud of you for pulling this off. But you this, not, is, this you, is disgusting. You did not like spiders going into this, right, David? Like spiders this? were my single biggest fear, like probably tied with like extreme heights. Spiders were... You know, even seeing like pictures of them, I'd start to get like sensitive and every little thing I'd feel, I'd be like, oh, it's a spider, even though I'm like in my house and it's just not a thing. 
Um, so I was very afraid of spiders going into this. And I knew that Australia would be, yes, it would be spider town over there, especially rural Australia. And yeah, describe um, describe the kinds of spiders we're talking about, because I, I think a lot of our audience is used to spiders as being things that rarely get bigger than a quarter. What what kind of spiders are we talking about here? We're talking hand sized spiders. We're talking. <laughs> yeah, that's different. We're, we're talking the huntsman spider, which is not a spider that's going to kill you or really harm you too badly. Though I did see a red back spider, which could kill you. Oh, um, it's basically a. No, it was I was I was working under the car and right on the inside of the wheel, I saw the this little black spider spider with the red on the back. And I was like, yo, what's this? And they're like, oh, that's a red back. And uh, my friend just grabbed a can of brake cleaner and sprayed it. And just we just kept wrenching. <laughs> but wow. uh, the bigger spiders, the huntsman, those are hard to ignore. Oh. Those those things. It's are, furry. Oh, Yeah. They're big. They're yeah, huge. They're near Jeez. tarantula like. So for people who are listening in and not watching on, on YouTube, let's describe what we're looking at here. This is a almost tarantula looking spider. It's, it's a skinny tarantula, really. Skinny. Yes. Yeah, skinny. Yeah. Where tarantulas I, are kind of beefy. These are a little skinnier. Yeah. I actually think skinnier is scarier. It is. Because, uh, if, yeah. if, it's, if it's fatter, you can. It's easier to keep track of all those appendages here. <laughs> like there's just too many legs. And you know what really sucks about huntsman spiders? The worst thing about them is they're so fast. They are ridiculous. In fact, I think I can play this video of it, of it just sprinting across the ground. It's <laughs> legitimately scary. Uh, yeah, anyway. Um, oh, God, look at it. Oh, it's horrible. Anyway. Oh, wow. here it is. That's, that's a fast spider. Yeah, a tarantula is almost cute sometimes. Yes. They're fuzzy and they have like those fat legs and they can almost be cute. These guys, I don't think, get a cute slow. very much. And they're slow. There it goes. Oh, yeah. He's pretty oh. quick. I bet they can do some. I bet they know how to do like identity theft and things like that, too. Can like they perform tricks anything. like a dog? Maybe. I bet they're cunning. Uh, anyway, yeah. th th there was a huge one there that, that was, you know, this this last one right here, the one that I refer to as the Megalodon. You're going to have to go to the site to see it. It's um, it, it, it was anyway, it doesn't matter. We got to stop. Well, with the well, most thing. of the time when you're wrenching on your car, these are not things you have to worry about unless you're from Australia. So, you know, the. This is cool. Long story short is by the end of it, after a month, I'm actually okay with spiders now. Like normal yeah. size spiders. Get Amazing. This was a, this is immersion therapy. This is like literal yeah. immersion therapy to get rid of a phobia and it works. Yep. So anybody out there afraid of spiders, all you have to do is go to Australia, spend a lot of time under a rusted out <sighs> ute in a field and let the spiders crawl over you until you're, you're better. Uh, why does it sound like it would terrorize me for the rest of my life and I'd have a uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder after that rather than being you know, acclimated to it? Uh, that's amazing. All right, let's move on from spiders to something that's more, more bow speed, I feel like, because it's Ford related. Okay. okay, there's a story that we wrote that did, did pretty well. The, the headline is, let's remember the hilariously half-assed engineering solution mm -hmm. Ford devised to compete with Chrysler's dual sliding doors on its minivan. So in the mid nineties, Chrysler was like, yo, you know, our minivan, it's got a sliding door. Well, look, we're putting one on the other side. And for some reason, um, I don't know. It didn't look like Ford was prepared to compete with that. And uh, their solution was one long driver's door. That was on the, the Windstar, right? This is on the Ford Windstar, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yes. So actually, there was a sliding door on the passenger side, right? Yep, that, correct. Mm -hmm. On the non-curb side. Right. Is that what you're told to sell them? Oh, non-curb uh, side. Yes. Well, that's how you called them. Or no, the curb side. Curb side, right, right. So curb side. So, so the you were implying, side didn't have a door. This, yeah. So the implication was as someone selling these, like, why would you want a sliding door on the street side? That's a death trap right there. Is that yes. what? That, yeah, that's why would you want that? So, so David, this was... And the then Chrysler door. said, yeah, go Chrysler ahead. said, um, yeah, we don't care. People are going to want it anyway. Um, yeah, so do. we're doing it. And, and it's not that straightforward. Like, it's not like you can just cut a hole in a van and, and put a sliding door in. Like, there's a, like, structurally, that is a huge deal. Think about it. Huge, like, two enormous holes on the yeah. side of a car. So all you've got, essentially, is your roof and the floor there. And, and, and it, that has to maintain your rigidity. It's not that straightforward. So, right. Um, 
yeah, it was a big deal. Well, and, and Ford was flummoxed about this too. I was, I sold these, you know, this is back in my car <laughs> selling days. And the funny thing is, I did not remember this King door like whatsoever. Um, uh, and then when I really thought about it, I'm like, I kind of vaguely remember that there was something out of there. But, uh, you know, we had this Aerostar, which wasn't totally a terrible van. You know, it, it had its moments. But when Chrysler came out with the dual sliding doors, it was like, oh, geez, how do we compete against that? And, uh, you know, like I said, we, we had to try to, you know, reference that, uh, okay, well, it's not that usable. You're on the other side of the curb. It's better structural rigidity. That was a lot of the sales, you know, pitch as well, whether it was, I don't know how accurate that was at the time, but we thought, you know, same as you, like taking out that center portion of the, of the, of the car, like, how do you have good rigidity? Well, they figured it out, obviously, and, and Ford uh, had yet to figure it out. But I remember <laughs> when we got that second sliding door, what a huge deal it was. And that King door, not even, like I said, I don't even remember it. So, so we anyway. should mention it's called King door, which sounds pretty, uh, uh, you know, aggrandized. But David, scroll back down to the dimensions, because it's actually not that different. than It looks like the, the same. Door. Let's see. So according to these. The actual amount it opened was 41 inches as opposed to 40 inches. But the angle it opened was a little more. It looks like the full open angle is, let's see, what is it? Like 65 degrees. I mean, it's honestly a little more. These diagrams are not great. Um, no, they're not well, selling uh, this very well at all. Because it looks like so it just opens. 90s a bit. American car company. Like, let's spend $100 million. <laughs> Uh, on a half-assed, you know, uh, idea that doesn't work rather than, you know, actually spending whatever it took to make it competitive, which they ultimately did anyway, right? So they just yeah. threw away a hundred million bucks uh, for this it's silly door. A hundred million dollars <laughs> for, for a inch. longer drive. An longer, inch. <laughs> for a <laughs> longer drive. It's hilarious. And, and okay. A hundred million dollars per inch. Seat is, folding is, is good, engineer. though. Like, I will say, I kind of want one of these. Just yeah. like now, it's incredible because the story. If you think about like what makes cars cool, that the, the stories behind them is half yeah. of it, right? And this has a ridiculous story. You know what else had a different sized uh, doors? Was the AMC Pacer had a wide had a wider passenger door than it the driver door? And I'm not. They're not that many. It's not super common to have cars with asymmetrical doors like this. So you could have a hell of a collection of your Aerostar and your Pacer in your asymmetric door collection, and you could Windstar. open a museum. This is the Windstar. 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 I'm sorry, Windstar, yes. not Aerostar. Windstar. At least it was front wheel drive, though, right? The Aerostar wasn't, if I recall. It was rear wheel. Which yeah. is it, what helped it actually. It wasn't a that wasn't a bad van. And it's funny, everyone's forgotten about the Aerostar, but they should forget about the Windstar. Anyway. <laughs> yep. Except for All you right. and door. I kind of love that. Speaking of engineering things, um, Torch, you wrote a story this week about uh the Rivian R1T's tonneau cover. Oh yeah. Which is um it's worth mentioning because it's it's just it's so intricate, like it's, it's a, a lot of gadget. Yeah, it's a lot of engineering basically to close and open the cover on a pickup bed. Like traditionally, tonneau covers are often fabrics that kind of roll up and pull back. They're like heavy vinyl. What Rivian's done is it's a series of hard aluminum slats. And what's crazy about the way it works is the amount. Okay, so if you have a hard tonneau cover, where you store it when it's not in place is tricky. And the Rivians, they have that big tunnel for storage behind the cab. Yeah. That's a big deal. So they don't want to take away any of that space to like the easy way would be like the the Tesla Cybertruck showed a similar tonneau cover, but it just rolled up like a giant, um, you know, like one of those security gate doors. Yeah. So it made like a big roll, which isn't very space efficient. So they could have done that, but that would have eaten into their the space that they have for the, the storage area. So what they made instead is it stacks the various slats like a Pez dispenser, like, like the Pez's yeah. pieces in a dispenser. And what's crazy about it is they're not actually really connected. It basically disassembles it when it pulls it in to stack and then reassembles it when it extracts out. It's like, it's a lot of clever engineering, but there are problems with it. They do get misaligned sometimes. The people over at Monroe tore one down and found places they could fix them. It's a lot of engineering for, but you know, I feel like the this, this market of EV pickups is so competitive. 
they have to be full of clever things like this to to happen. I love overcomplicated solutions for fairly simple problems. You know? Yeah, you're, you're, yeah, it's a cover that goes on and off. <laughs> right. You know what? I, that's that is what the R1T is. I mean, it's 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 just a gadget truck, and yeah. it's char it's charming in a way. Like when I first drove one, I was like, wow, there are so yeah, many are gizmos and gadgets and like little details. And meanwhile, the Ford Lightning, which I think F one fifty Lightning, I think is the only other. Well, right now, production, yeah, production, like production is production. kind of a quote unquote, but yeah, it sort of did it went the opposite direction, kind yeah. of a little like simpler, um, which I actually actually prefer. I can't, I, I really think. Well, it's you know, an they, electric F one fifty versus that's an all what it is. Truck. I mean, they were. I think Ford was smart. They put all that uh, effort into just making a really usable front trunk area, which kind of covers anything you'd need to cover up it with a tonneau cover, really. And like, that's kind of the point too. You already have a front; you can lock it in there. Yeah. This is really for locking, and yeah, th this seems overly complicated. But I love the fact that it does completely take itself apart and then basically <laughs> build it back. You know, yeah. for, or, or to put put it on the bed for you. It is. I safe. assumed it was hinged in some way, like there was some yeah. sort of folding Z hinges, but it's not. They actually disconnect and get stacked up, so it literally takes it apart stacks it all neat and tight and then puts it back together which is uh, it's bonkers That's no it, bonkers. It, it is great and, and if you if you like that side of cars like the kind of the nuts and bolts of cars it's hard not to be charmed by just the gears yeah. and the little rack you know there's just something about that is i bet it sounds good and is really satisfying good. when it like clonks all together it's not like there. a factory like building something <laughs> yeah <laughs> it'd be yeah, only yeah, better exactly. if they could somehow <laughs> melt it down into a liquid slag <laughs> and then recast it as it comes out but i don't know yeah. if we're there yet someday uh, but cool. all right all right let's see Great what stuff. else do we have oh um okay a couple more stories and then we'll get to our guest torch you uh you wrote something about humanoid robots. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, there was a lot of talk. So Tesla had their big uh, AI day, uh, which they do every year where they talk about the artificial intelligence. And there is a there is a ton of hype around what they call Optima, uh, the um, their Optimus, I guess. Yeah, their their robot that they're working on, the humanoid style robot. And this is getting a the the amount of hyperbole from the hardcore Tesla fans is absolutely staggering. I mean, if you know this community, it's not shocking. But the, there's a couple of key things to remember. That's first, lots of car companies have been making humanoid robots for a long time. Honda had their Asimo robot since like the late 90s that would walk Love around. Uh, and yeah, and the demonstration of the uh, that Tesla did is they had one version of the robot kind of came out. And he walked slowly. He walked like you'd walk when you're coming home late from curfew and you don't want to let anyone in the house know that you were late. So it walked kind of gingerly. And then it was like you shit yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's and then awesome they had a, a more refined version of the Tesla robot that only waved and they had three guys around it to make sure it didn't fall over. Now, Tesla has come a long way since the dude in the spandex suit last year. They, you know, <laughs> what they built is impressive, but it's not. This is not world changing. Other companies have What's built this robots robot supposed to do? More. I'm trying to figure this out. Is it to replace well, a human? He said no. So what does it do if it doesn't well, replace what they a human? Claim, if you read these people's uh, <laughs> people in the comments talking about this thing are saying that, you know, like the, the Tesla fans are saying this robot is going to eliminate poverty is what they're saying. They're I, saying it's going to replace low level jobs. And then there's a lot of gray area. And then somehow that equals no more poverty. Well, I, don't people need to work to that's a great maintain question, a though. living? I would you, think. Yeah, you like, would think that would be part of I it. I wouldn't call those low level jobs or call manufacturing jobs that are, you know, they're important take jobs. skill. They're they very are. important. And, yeah, uh, it, absolutely. Jobs to be proud of. Yes. But yeah, there um it's it, there's a lot of hype around this thing. I think there's other companies like Boston, you know, Boston Dynamics that is already we've seen those robots dancing and doing parkour and stuff. You know, they're late to the game. You know, I'm sure they have talented people working on this thing, but um, I, you know, the I, the hype around it is absolutely absurd. It is, uh, there's a long way to go. Maybe these things will be a big deal. Also, 
Somebody talked about how one day they're excited to have this thing doing their laundry and washing their dishes. We already have robots that do our laundry and washing our dishes. They're made by Maytag and Whirlpool, and we have them. They exist. They just don't look like a dude. But uh, literally, you have a dishwashing robot in your house. Well, they want someone to be able to take it out of the hamper and put it into the washer for them because that is beneath them as well. Yeah, exactly. They don't want to take it from from the floor of their bedroom and dump it in the machine. So yeah look i've already solved this problem just don't do dishes <laughs> yeah. seen... and that <laughs> works too I'm doing it yes that solves the problem with zero ai <laughs> all yeah. right um last story we're going to talk about uh this week it was um written by a contributor emily velasco about 3d printing parts yeah yeah this is um, cool and that was great um and okay. uh, yeah you should Okay, go ahead. Well, I just want to mention Emily, someone I've been following online for a long time. She does all kinds of fascinating projects. She's uh, and she like does electronics and she does a lot of great 3D printing. And she just bought uh, it was her dad's old Toyota pickup truck and she had it painted this amazing green. But the side marker lamps were not working. Basic and what had gone wrong is the plastic. Uh, housing behind the lens had just turned to crap. It just crumbled into garbage when she touched it. This is one of those things that legally she has to get this fixed. These parts, if you put them all together and buy new ones, are actually kind of expensive because they're not super common anymore. They're a perfect application for what 3D printing, as it stands right now, is good at doing. And cars are actually full of this kind of stuff. So she went through the trouble. She measured them out. She rebuilt them in a 3D program. She 3D printed them. She got them to match up to the lenses. She made it so new bulb sockets would fit in there. And she remanufactured a part for her car. And the whole thing took her, I think she said it was in the end, it was like maybe 50 bucks of stuff. She used like silver nail polish to make sure it was reflective enough on the inside. And the result is great, possibly even better than new. They look amazing. And right now, people are wondering when this kind of 3D printing revolution is going to happen. And the thing is, it's for the right parts. If you're smart about what you're making, it's already starting. And I believe she put this file out on Thingverse. So if you have one of these Toyota pickups and the plastic is decaying like so many of them are, you can download this thing, print it out in your printer and be done with it for almost nothing. It's This is amazing, by the way. And your point about taking the technology and using it for exactly what it needs to be. And the fact that she actually did this herself, that it can be done yourself, to me, just blows my mind. I love this. I do too. You know, a great application for this, Bo, you you own so many cars that you can't find replacement parts for. You know, like a lot of, many of them are, Plenty of them are one of one. Plenty of them are like one of, you know, double digits at most. And if you lose a lens or a, probably more likely an interior trim part or something like that. Knobs. You, if you break it or you lose it, you got to make it. That's right. Um, and so and this. To be able yeah. to just print it. Oh, this is cool. Uh, this and is- the fact that there's a community element that you someone out there can design something once and then make it available for other people who may have these cars or try and restore them. That's incredible. Like, that's really amazing. That's really everybody really working together no matter where they are. Wait, did Amelia, is, Emily, excuse me, did she take this to our car show? She did. Yeah, she had yeah, it at the Utopia meetup. The, that's right. It's, it's so a, cool. It's a pretty green truck. She it's also really made her own cool. curtains in the camper bed out of some old... Uh, yeah. Like sheets that had planets on them. It's a very cool little truck and she's great. So we're going to have more from her. Yeah, more 3D amazing. printed stuff, more interesting stuff like that. Because it's, we're, 3D printers have been around a little while, but I feel like we're just now getting to the point where it kind of makes sense for stuff like this. Yeah, it's, that it's does. Oh, super yeah. cool. Yeah, you know, right. we should talk with Mark Brinker and Myron Ver- Vernus about yes. th- 3D printed parts. and Because they collectors with rare obscure vehicles where you need parts mm, let's bring them on and uh yeah, yeah let's see what they what okay. they think about that i love it you gotta hear how weird their cars are now oh you have no idea they're so good all right hi good afternoon hey myron hi, goes. hi myron hi, Mark. Hey guys. how are you guys doing doing great how are good you good to see you myron welcome um, to the autopia hey, David. podcast <clears throat> thank you <laughs> I'm uh I'm sorry we uh, had to get canceled last time we had the big hurricane so we were supposed to do this last week but all my power <laughs> went out uh, so I'm just glad 
I'm glad everybody's here now. But yeah, I'm excited. Jason, that, that, yeah. that wasn't that wasn't very considerate of you, Jason. You know, no, was yourself no, in the no, middle of a hurricane. I was being pretty selfish. It's true. <laughs> okay, so Torch, if yes. you don't mind, we'll have you introduce Myron, and then Myron, if you could introduce Mark. Okay, yeah. So. Uh, Myron is someone I feel like everybody in the uh, weird auto community knows Myron in some way. There's some cars that you've seen that Myron like you, you, you'll find something interesting and strange. Myron will have one of these things. He has an amazing collection and fantastic taste in cars. I personally sold him my beloved Reliant Scimitar GTE partially because I knew Myron was going to take care of it. I knew Myron would give it the home it deserved that I could no longer give it. And I feel like that's that's um that's an important statement to make about somebody. If you're willing to give a uh, an important car to you to them. And Myron's also, I want to add, and I hope we can get to this, maybe the only person I can think of that has had any history of collecting Greek cars. Limited, because it's hard to find Greek cars. It's hard to find people who know anything about Greek cars. But Myron, and your background is Greek, right, Myron? Your yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm Greek. And uh, yeah, I do have a couple of Greek cars. It's, it's a country that never should have made cars, but uh, <laughs> I didn't know they cars. did. <laughs> They did. Yeah, then we could we'll talk about those in a minute. But Myron is um, a lot of JDM cars. Myron has uh, and which will lead to their current project between him and, him and Mark. Um, so it's it's a really remarkable collection of genuinely interesting stuff. Um, he's you're based. He's based out of Akron, Ohio. And it's uh, it's a whole big warehouse. And you just walk in there and there's it's, it's everything is so, so good. So I'm just delighted to have Myron here. Very friendly guy. Also, everybody in the community loves him. Uh, Myron, why don't you introduce uh, uh, Mark now? Well, before you yeah, do that, I'll say we... I'll say Myron is a legend in the car journalism sphere. Uh, a uh, a visit to Myron is kind of like a that's just almost like initiation into right a car journal. I haven't done it yet, but uh, many people have, and uh, so yeah, th uh, thanks for joining us. You are a legend, uh, but we'd love to meet Mark. All right, Dave, David, you'll be worthy someday. I'll let you know when when that time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, um, you, you know, you put me in a real tough situation to introduce uh, Mark because uh, in addition to being one of my best friends, he, he is a remarkable guy all around. Just not a remarkable car guy. He's a world-renowned uh, orthopedic surgeon. Wow. Um, has, uh, I mean, continues to be active in that, has written textbooks in orthopedic surgery, developed techniques, uh, grows bones in people's bodies. But I wow. guess that's not what we're here to talk about today. But uh, yeah, Mark know, and I met no, early. That sounds cool. Growing. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Mark, I'm sure Mark will be happy to talk to you about that. But uh, we met about 20 years ago over weird cars, I think. Um, Mark was looking for a car to uh, to take to Bonneville and he had a very specific car in mind. The word got out that I had one. It was a, a Deutsche Bonnet HBR5. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I actually had a couple at the time <laughs> and I had no interest in selling it. But once he told me what his plans for it were, um, you know, I passed it along. He went and set seven records at Bonneville with the car. And uh, we've been, uh, you know, best of buds, uh, buds since. And uh, really, you know, Mark is probably the best person to tell you about himself. So, Mark, I'm going to pass it on to you. Well, I don't know that I'm very good about telling anything about myself. Um, I guess for the purpose of this podcast is, uh, you know, I'm passionate about, about cars. I'm passionate about the history of cars. Uh, I enjoy writing in all kinds of arenas. So car history is a uh, natural for that. Um, I like learning about cars. And so my collection has sort of weaved through the car hobby through different interests. Um, and uh, I agree with you that Myron is a legend in the car hobby and uh, I just worship at his feet. <laughs> well, we should also mention that you guys have an amazing four volume book set out. This book is tremendous. I, I, yeah. I, I, I can't even describe it. It looks like a encyclopedia practically. Yeah, I have a, I have a brochure here. We'll, we'll get an actual <laughs> picture there. It, it's amazing, though. I looked at it in person. It is stunning. It's one of these beautiful coffee table books that you just want to like hold and look at and colossal pictures. It's called um, A Quiet, A Quiet Greatness. And it's it's the it's the definitive guide to Japanese collector cars. And actually, maybe we could start this like because what I'm curious about is why do you guys think it's taken so long for Japanese collector cars to be 
respected enough to like this book, I feel like should have been something that existed a long time ago. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? What do you, what's going on there? Byron, well, you why, know, don't you, why don't you take the first part of the question and I'll take the second part about the book. Perfect. Uh, it, what, you know, we, Jason, totally agree with you. That's, you know, we were thinking the exact same thing that that part of the hobby, you know, really needed this, you know, just like excellence was expected did for the Porsche hobby, the, the Japanese car hobby needed something like that, but someone had to step forth to do that. Right. And uh, actually, you know, Mark and I talked about it. I mean, this thing took us six years. We talked about it for probably two years before that. And um, it was, uh, I think it just took someone to do it. Funny thing, at, at Pebble Beach, when we rolled it out, someone said, aren't you afraid that people are going to start copying you now? I said, no, you know, I'm not afraid. That's what we're hoping for. And that's why yeah. we did this, because there are really great cars out there. And we're hoping that to kickstart the legitimacy at the top level of Japanese uh, of Japanese collector cars. So, um, you know, we were just ones dumb enough to do it, basically. <laughs> and uh, we, we approached some of the great uh, book publishers out there with our ideas and first look at the book. And they all said, this is fantastic. This is amazing. But it's about Japanese cars. Exactly. So, that's the attitude. I feel like that's been like Pebble didn't even have a category for Japanese cars until fairly recently. Is that right? Well, they still don't. They still they still don't. So Disney, which feels r ridiculous to me. Huh? Wow. But yeah, hopefully so, something like this will change that. So just to add to that, I, I think, you know, to do a book like this really required um, incredible passion and stupidity sort of combined, <laughs> rolled into one team. Um, and I think Myron and I both both have that combination of passion and stupidity. When we first started planning this, um, you know, we made a list of cars and then we sort of modeled out, OK, how many pages would it be and what would the book look like? And so we both nodded and say, OK, let's do this. And the idea was that the book had to be as good as any book on any other subject. It had to be as good, like if we're writing about Bugattis, you know, right. uh, you know, because if, there's some soft cover books, there's some low quality books, um, and they just don't send the message of quality that is needed for, you know, the Japanese car segment. Yeah. Well, what happened was we kept learning about new cars and, you know, the, the list just sort of spiraled out of control. But we were committed to staying on the path. And the way we approached it didn't change. It just took more time. And there's lots of challenges to writing a book like this. Um, some of the cars, very little is known. Yeah. We, had to get, we had to get translators, you know, to translate Japanese language for us. Because Google Translate, you know, can only do so much. Right. Um, and I also think that Myron and I have a, a unique set of skills that are very different from one another. I think the way that he approached the project and the way I approached the project were vastly different. And I think the project needed the skills that each of us have, um, sort of to be, you know, symbiotic. I don't think I could have written this book at all without Myron, and I hope he feels the same way. Um, so I think it was a really good team effort, and uh, I it was a Herculean effort, and so you know that that lets a lot of people out. Well, you guys passion and stupidity to Sorry. me that's uh, mm -hmm. you know that's the utopian <laughs> ethos right there. <laughs> so I think that was our tagline <laughs> when we opened. There you uh, go. So I think that defines perfectly. So you guys fit right in, which is what, what I love. Sorry, Jason, that's I was good. interrupting you. Oh no, it's okay. I was just asking if there was. Did you guys end up traveling to Japan a bunch to uh, research the book? You know, time timing hurt us there. Right, our plan oh. was to be there in the middle of October of yeah. 2020. Well, yeah, it's not a great <laughs> and, yeah. You know, the, the, and the great thing is we had fantastic relationship with all the major Japanese manufacturers. They gave us full access to their archives, their, their right. heritage centers. So the, the plan was there. But uh, yeah, we had that little obstacle. But, you know, with, with the miracle of the Internet, um, it was almost like being there. Actually, we, we found right. photos and things that people had in their archives that they had no idea that they had. You know, we, we would go through we. Mark and I would spend weeks going through like Nissan's all in every image in the Nissan archives 
again, with, with uh, the access that we had to everything, it worked out. So and, and, I, was, and I think we need to, I think we need to add one more person to our team. Uh, is uh, mentioned, we have to uh, mention Richard Barron, who was our art director. Uh, you know, yeah. Mark and I aren't artistic people. Richard was the uh, road and track uh, director of art for 30 years. I mean, during its prime, and he put the book together for us. He's done the Look to Cult books and uh, it's beautiful. Early spoke yeah. things. So, yeah. Yeah, it looks, it looks gorgeous. Incredible. So, what was the most surprising or interesting thing that you found when you were doing your research that you didn't know before you started? Mark? Yeah, so uh, I knew that there were a great many uh, models that I'd never heard of, but, um, you know, it, it's sort of like how deep is a ditch, right? So I knew there was going to be a lot. And the way I like to approach things is I like to figure out the entire field of what we have to study or write about and then start knocking it down when it's this deep, dark hole you don't know if you're a quarter of the way there or halfway there or 1%. So the most surprising thing to me was just the sheer volume uh, of cars that we had to study and learn about and some just to decide, okay, we're not going to cover that. And here's why. Because the book is almost 1400 pages and there's a incredible amount of information, but it's not the complete history of Japanese car production or even post-war car production. It's, it's what, you know, Vernus and Brinker think are the most important, the coolest, um, you know, whatever, whatever you, word you want to use. But we had to make some decisions about what, what is the most collectible and coveted and, and cherished and important. Did you, um, oh, sorry. I was wondering where you started. Did you start with the uh, like the flying feather, or do you go back even even further? So the the the, the book is all post war. All post war. Okay. Right. Flying feather was just post war, or was it right before? It, so it, what's it a flying a, feather? Oh, well, okay. this, this isn't amazing. Is I'll, I'll let these guys tell it because it's one of my favorites of these early Japanese cars, and it's. It's so minimal and lean. Myron or or Mark, why don't you tell us about this car? It's it's uh it's a Japanese uh, cycle car basically. It's got bicycle wheels and tires. It was uh, one of the the first attempt to do a car for the masses in Japan. So, um, it, it's a pretty cool. Car. In fact, I saw it. I think it's in the the vault at the Peterson at the moment. I thought I saw it there oh, two really? weeks ago. How many are left of these things? Oh, you know, I don't know. It's cool. It, you know, yeah, it, it's not in the book. Oh, it's um, spoiler, not in the book. Okay. Spoiler alert. It's not in the book. Uh, well, it's it's I it's one of my favorites. It's it reminds me almost of like a metal Velorex. It's like little rear engine. It's a it's a very cool little thing. But if that didn't make the cut, I can only imagine like how cool everything that Yeah, let's hear what's in the book. I want to hear about yeah. some cool cars in the <laughs> what's book. What's in the book? <laughs> All right. So yeah, wait, yeah. Tell us like uh just give me a sense of like what's the earliest one that you got in there? Like right. It, it's the, the Datsun D20, you know, their okay. first sports car, the, the pickup trucks that they converted oh. into sports cars yeah. and then, ha then had to convert them back to pickup trucks because they couldn't <laughs> sell them as sports cars. <laughs> it's amazing. God, do you have a favorite? Uh, for me to you, like Myron, what would be your favorite out of all so, this? So here's the crazy thing, you know, and, and Bo asked, you know, what was the most surprising thing? The, the most surprising thing that I think that happened to both of us is because originally this was going to be a 300 page, one volume book, all said and done, we're going to get done in a year. Um, as Mark said, we kept discovering cars, and uh, as we and discovered cars, <laughs> and we, we started buying them, right? So, I love you guys. so, so the book the book cost us a fortune to to put together and print, but it cost us like multiples of that because of the cars that we <laughs> discovered. Um, you, you know, I I'd say mine is is the Autech Zagato, because yes. literally I I didn't know it existed until we started on the book, and. Um, you know, I just just love that car. It's a wacky car. This is a fantastically uh, weird car. For those who are just listening, can you describe this car? Because it's somewhat challenging to describe, in my opinion. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> it's challenging to look at by sometimes. It is. To it. It, yeah. <laughs> but because uh, the, the fenders late... are kind of disconnected from the hood, but well, it, yeah, they're the yeah. You should explain what they are. What those crazy humps actually are. Yeah, the, actually, the the mirrors are, are kind of tucked in there. Yeah, the, the side <laughs> mirrors are tucked in there, and and they're not very functional either. But they they made you know they made a statement. So, you know, in the late '80s, Japan was in their bubble economy. 
And uh, they came, uh, Nissan came up with this. They wanted this idea to start a new luxury, kind of like an AMG to Mercedes. And they called it Autec. And they, a, they had the guy who was head of all the GTRs go over and be the new president of Autec. And they wanted to do like a, a special car to introduce this brand. So they went to Zagato and had them design a car to uh, put on a Nissan Leopard chassis with an Autec tuned engine. And actually, yeah, you know, it was, and, then, and then the bubble economy crashed. And the Zagato wasn't doing well at the time either. Actually, Nissan had to go in. It's in the book. But Nissan had to go in and buy 50% of Zagato to, uh, to finish the cars. Um, so the plan was to build 200, 200 of them and sell them for $160,000 a piece. In 1989, they ended up building, I think, about 88. Wow. So, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Hand, a handmade aluminum body by, uh, by Zagato. Uh, with Nissan Leopard chassis, 320 horsepower, rear wheel drive, just a great cruising car. Myron let me drive his when I went to visit him and it was a huge treat. The thing feels, I mean, the look is amazing. It doesn't look like anything else. It has an inverted horseshoe shaped grill, which I can't think of another car that might have that. And the inside also is very, it feels exactly of its era. I don't even know how to describe it, it but it doesn't feel like anything else. The proportions are strange. It's Detail strange. All the, you know, there was one at Pebble Beach that was up on the hill that I got a chance to look at. I think it's the first time I've really looked at one in person. And this car is absolutely incredible. But the lines you can't describe, I don't know, in, in words because they're all over the place. Just that the way the hood comes up in those two bubbles, like, like the double bubble Zagato, instead of being on the hood, it's now like the sides of the, uh, or on top of the, the, the roof. Now it's on the sides of the hood. It's just completely, I don't even, it, it's bizarre. But I love it. And I love that there are only 88 of them. Yeah, it's cool. And that was my car, Bo, that you saw at Pebble oh. Beach. <laughs> and, uh, of course and somehow I ended up with two of, somehow we ended up with two of them, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> so, Mark, how about you? So, um, you know, like Myron said, uh, this was not only an expensive project, uh, putting the book together, but I, I think Myron probably today has more Japanese cars than I do, but I think he had a head start on me and I, I I'd wager a dollar that I actually bought more cars during the process of writing. Maybe <laughs> not, but, um, but you know, it's the car hobby, so we're competitive. Um, no, no, wait a minute. It was a, it was a competition there for a while. <laughs> I just, the one that gets me is a Z432. They were, Mark and I were both hot after a Z432, and uh, we both had different brokers looking out for one. And a beautiful one came up for auction in Japan. And, uh, his broker called him. He was in Houston and awake. My broker called me. I was in Greece and sleeping. So Mark, <laughs> Mark got the car. Wow. That'll I mean, teach you to sleep. So, you know, they built 170,000 240Zs for the, for the world. Yeah. Um, most of them were sold in the United States. Uh, they built 420 cars with a twin cam racing engine. And this was, you know, from, from the factory different chassis designation, twin cam, two liter motor, um, just a great driving car. They're all right-hand drive. Um, all badge you know, fair ladies, I guess. They're all badge fair ladies and they're called 432s. Yeah. Uh, and the 432 stands for four valves per cylinder, uh, three carburetors and two camshafts. Wow. Cool. Um, you know, one, one of the themes in my collection, not just for, Japanese cars, but I collect Italian cars. I collect American cars and I like, I like cars with twin cam engines. So that's a little, a little theme in my Japanese collection. I, I've got the Z432. I've got an Isuzu Belay GTR, which is a beautiful car. twin cam racing Isuzu. Yeah. Um, I've got a Mitsubishi Gallant GTO MR as does Myron, uh, which is a twin cam Mitsubishi. So, um, but I, I, I think the, uh, and there, there's a number of other cars, you know, that uh, that sort of came to me through the book process. I've, I have a Nissan Cherry X1R. If you can put that up, it's sort of a, a wild looking thing with a huge rear sail panel. Can you all find one of those? You got to try to describe this uh, as well. I don't know how to describe it. There it is. <laughs> oh, these. I know these. I love these cars. 
Oh, yeah. geez. They're what? so strange looking. They feel like oh, a Mustang Mach 1 kind of okay, shrunken Torch. down a little. Go yeah. for it, Torch. Try to describe this. All right. So I'd love to. Okay. So picture a car a little from the B pillar forward, from the do- end of the door forward. It feels kind of like a lot of small Nissans, but yeah. then the whole back half of it is like it was inflated. It's like a fast back, very shockingly little window. And the C pillar could be the largest C pillar I've, on any car proportionally ever. It's sort of like a Mustang Mach 1 fastback. It's bulky and strange and wonderful. Mm. It would be like a shooting break if you filled in the windows in the back. Yeah, it's almost van like, but it's a fastback. Right. And, and then it's, it's got the and wheels. The front could be a little Honda, too. It just it, It's completely bizarre from the front to the rear, don't make any sense. I love <laughs> and it. And then it's got undersized wheels and tires, which make it look sort of cartoonish. But oh, and the taillights are yes. also big, round oh, jet engine beautiful. taillights, which right. make it even better. Yeah, it's oh, uh, this is cool. It's extremely cool. Little I've car. never so, seen this before. So I fell, I fell prey to one of those. Um, what is that poking <laughs> in that picture? Yeah, is is that an Autech Myron, the blue car? No, no, no. Oh, out of the corner. That, what is that going past? Oh. Uh, I can't see enough of it. Um, So um, other cars I fell in love with during the process of writing the book was um, a uh, Nissan Pulsar GTIR. Uh, Oh, yeah. um, Homologation special there, right? Right. So I searched pretty much from the beginning of when we started writing for about four years for a Nismo edition. And um, I can't remember how it came to me that they, they made like maybe 20 of those. And that's the Holy Grail, not because it necessarily drives a lot different, but it's just, you know, impossible to find. And it's Nismo. Um, so I found one in Canada and I can't even tell you where in Canada, other than I can tell you when you cross the U.S. border, you drive for about nine and a half hours. <laughs> and I didn't even know you could drive that far uh, north in Canada, but a guy who helps me with cars, who's like a real, you know, can do anything kind of guy, total stud, nothing ever bothers him. He calls me in the middle of the night. He's like lost in Canada in this little town with no lights and is terrified. Oh. Like He's going to wind up in a freezer like somebody harvesting his kidneys or something. Oh, it's Canada. <laughs> Come on. He, he may have found the Northwest Passage, though, which would be great I don't know. for, you know, getting t- Anyway, he he dragged it. He dragged it back. Um, and it, they're fabulous cars. You know, everywhere you look, there's Nismo stuff, Nismo steering wheel, Nismo shifter, Nismo seats, you know, Nis, Nismo floor bracing. Um, and the car is an absolute rocket ship to drive. Wow, it's got wow. 227 horsepower. But it's all wheel drive. And it it when you hit the gas, it's like the Millennium Falcon. You just feel <laughs> like, you know, like you're shoved back in the seat and you feel like you're in, in the World Rally Championship. Amazing. These cars, Nissan intended these cars to be like World Rally Championship champions. Uh, they put the intercooler on top of the engine, and so they overheated. Um, their only podium finish was in the Swedish rally because it was cold, you know, zero degrees. Yeah. Um, but, you know, unless you're going to be driving a thousand miles across the, an African desert, um, they're, they're unbelievably great driving cars and they're huge bargains. I mean, you can pick a car up for a nice car for 20, 25 grand still. Um, but not so in this mall, not in this mall. Not an ISMO, not an ISMO. But we we should pl- we should give our friends on Bat a little bit of help right now. There's a beautiful NISMO for sale on Bat right now, and oh, um, bring it some, Yeah, someone on this podcast may or may not be that current hybrid. Ah, well, see what I love about this car mm-hmm. is it, it's not an ostentatious car. This is a to to many people it just looks like a regular hatchback with a big hood scoop on it, um, but it's. B- Below the skin is what matters, and and that's that's I like I like that in some cars. No, these are very cool. Let me right. put one up here. I I, I spot these every now and oh, then yeah. when I visit my brother in Hong Kong. Yep. And I don't know if th- I don't know if this is a real one, uh, a GTIR, but in any case, um, I don't know if you if if you uh, have, have followed um, 
any of my articles from back in the day about Hong Kong's abandoned cars, but the, mm. the abandoned cars in Hong Kong are absolutely incredible. <laughs> like, like there are extremely rare uh, Japanese sports cars just everywhere in Hong Kong, just, just sitting there. And, and I've, I've written a whole bunch about it. Um, I remember seeing, um, what were those? Uh, the, uh, Mitsubishi Mont- Montero Evolutions. I see those all the time. Pajero Evolutions. Oh, Pajero. Yeah, yeah. The Pajero Evolutions. Uh, and then I'd see these GTIRs. And you just see everything. And it would just, be, for the number of reasons um, in Japan, uh, in, in Hong Kong, people just abandon these extremely rare cars and they just sit there for forever. You know, David, we we got, uh, again, with 2,200 images, we, we got photographs, we harvested, we commissioned. But we had a lot of help from Japanese car JDM enthusiasts in Hong Kong. Oh, wow. And, and the, 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 the culture there is super strong. And these guys, I mean, you talk about insane but passionate. They were, they were sending us pictures of drive-bys and things, of cars that we wanted, like during that whole political unrest that was going on a couple of years ago. They were risking, <laughs> literally risking their lives to get shots of cars for us. And, and, be- wow. and beautiful shots. Um, so the... <laughs> The, the, the end of the story uh, is that about six months after I, I captured the Pulsar Nismo from, again, I don't know where in Canada. Actually, the reason that the guy sold me the car, he loved the car, um, he was going into um, Bitcoin mining and he needed the money to buy, you know, Mm. whatever it is you buy to mine bitcoins and this was a, dr- a drill or something yeah i think it's yeah, a, drill, a hydraulic <laughs> drill yeah. yeah so about six months later i got another call um from norway and bought a second a second of the 20 of course wow. you have to have two right one's not enough and i think i sent you a picture <laughs> We got ten percent of the entire i think i sent you guys <laughs> yeah, a picture wild. of it <laughs> You guys have the pictures I sent? Uh, yes. Let me let me see if I can find it here. I think oh, I, sent, I have it. Okay, so I think I sent you. A, this is an Evan Klein photo. If it's the one I'm thinking of. Oh, that's oh, a fantastic. Oh, that's photo. cool. Yeah. Wow, so, this- so if you get if you get a fabulous photographer like Evan Klein, suddenly it doesn't look so much like a grocery getter. But I mean, this car just absolutely rips. Um, and for those just like- listening, you have to picture. A small hatchback, but with every possible vent that you could stick on it on the front of it. It is like every window air conditioner's worth of vents that you can find all on there. This thing clearly it's means it's a great business. skull, you know, it's like teeth in front. Yeah, it is. It is kind of yeah, toothy and yeah, and it's like it wants air badly. Whatever this is, so you know something big is going on. It's it's a remarkable little car. I love these things. It's like if you took a panda bear and gave it a, a machine gun. It, it, it goes. <laughs> yeah. it, it, go, it goes from being you know, it, it means business exactly. Yeah, it, it okay. does. And and I've had lots of people that are well, you know, famous people in the hobby. Not quite as famous as Myron, but famous people in the hobby come to Houston, drive the car, and they look at it and like, really, you want me to drive that? And they come back and they're like, oh, my God. You know, <laughs> really, sh- it's a shocking car. Yeah, I love it. So All right, cool. well, we should talk. Speaking of shocking cars, what, let's uh, let's expand a little and talk about some of the other weird stuff in your various collections. Myron, I, I do, bef- I don't want to end this before we lose you talking about your Greek cars because they're incredible. And there's still more Japanese ones I know to talk to. David just showed up. Well, you showed a Cosmo there. You know, yeah. Speaking of performance cars, you have a Cosmo, correct? We both have Cosmo. Actually, I, oh, my daily did. driver the last few days has been a Cosmo. I, I just <laughs> drive on 15 <laughs> oh, minutes ago. So. <laughs> so, let's, oh, so describe cool. the Cosmo for people who may not be aware of, of this car, why it's so historically important, because it is incredible. Well, not only is it Mazda's first uh, rotary production car, it was the world's first twin rotor production car. And, uh, you know, they were made for five years. They were handmade cars. They made one a day for five years. Wow. Um, it's, uh, you know, of all the cars I have, the Cosmo and probably the Citroen CX wagon are probably the two most unique driving experiences. They're just, uh, it's just a super, super special car. I, um, a good friend of, uh, of Mark and mine, uh, who, who was a, an automotive historian, drove mine while well, I still had it in Greece. 
And he called it like a Lotus salon with a turbine engine. It's kind of like the closest <laughs> he could come to. It's just a super special car and just a, a pure joy to drive. Mine's a driver. Mine's not nearly as good looking as Mark's in, in, in that picture, but uh, the, the joy is in driving it. Yeah, absolutely. So, but, so by the way, I, I have a Cosmo too. And I, I absolutely love it. I think you've got the extended one also, which gives a little bit of room because these things are tidy. I mean, it's a sports car, but it looks like a micro sports car to some degree. And just uh, squeezing in this thing. And then, of course, you know, it's a, it's a right-hand drive. So you're driving a stick with the left, which is always a little bit disconcerting. But, you know, when I take off on this thing, because it is a joy to drive, but it, it, it feels like I'm starting off in third gear. You know what I mean? Because it, it takes a while to wind up. Am I, am I missing something here? But once you get going, it drives beautifully, but it seems to take a while to get there. Well, I, I think that that's kind of true of pretty much any rotary engine car. Yeah. You know, that l- there's not a lot of low end torque. You know, you, you have to get up there. They're momentum cars, especially the early cars, the small displacement uh Cars like like the Wankel Spider. I even have yeah. um, a car. Well, yeah, like the NSU Wankel Spider, which is the first production rotary car, and it's it's got an engine half the size of the Cosmo. Wow. <laughs> it's, oh, it's beautiful, but it's a dog. It's an absolute <laughs> dog. <laughs> so the Cosmo, beautiful. the Cosmo's engine is what? What is it? One point three? One point one? No, one, it's one, one liter. One liter. Exactly. One liter. Yeah, an entire liter. Yeah. yeah. Between two rotors, also. That's right. No, it's not even one liter in a whole road. It's between two of those rotors is one liter. It's amazing. Yeah, that's a fantastic car. I didn't realize there was an extended wheelbase one and a, a short one, though. I didn't know that. The first, they, they were, the first year, the, right? Uh, yeah, they uh, the Series uh, 1 and Series 2. The Series 1 cars, they built about 300. And the Series 2, they built like the other 1,000. And there's the easiest way to look at it, if you look in the book, we have them side by side. It's never been done before because the average person, a Cosmo is a Cosmo. Wow. And we did we did a side by side comparisons. And the, the easiest way to point out is the Series 2 has five inches more in the rear dog leg. So five inches more from the rear of the door to the wheel well, to the rear wheel well. Ah. And some of that translates into a little bit of extra leg room so that normal size American guys can fit in. I I can't even imagine five five inches shorter than it it already is. That's incredible. (laughs) Yeah, so I would would slightly say a little different from Myron. Uh, I don't think it's a slight different. I can't even get into a series one car. I'm six foot two and I can drive, I can drive a series two car without any problem. I mean, it's, it's not huge inside, but it's not a, it's not a big problem, but the series one cars, I literally can't even get in. So um, anybody in the market, if you're tall, forget about a series one car. (laughs) You know, Jason and I always, we always say that if you're a car lover, being smaller is kind of, it's kind of, it's like, it's kind of better in some ways. If yeah. you're a car person. Oh, tremendous. Right. Well, Sucks yeah. everywhere else, but. <laughs> no, no, it, 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 re- it really doesn't suck everywhere else. You know, there's an old <laughs> Greek saying that says, this is the short, the, the tall man is the slave of the short man. And that's, that's absolutely true. My, my daughter, our, our youngest daughter is six, three, and she's Whoa. just kind of like this nice kind of like always smiling kind of person. She can't go to a store without at least a dozen little old ladies asking her to do something. For her. <laughs> yeah. Well, I something just, else at top shelf. <laughs> just off topic, just a little bit. If any of your uh, viewers want their legs lengthened or shortened, that's, <laughs> that's part of what I do. Oh, oh really? So, right. If you want, if you that's want a car a bad enough, surgery. say again. That's a fascinating surgery. So how many inches could I potentially grow? Cause I'm sure I'm the shortest in my family. And if, it, if I really wanted to do this, yeah. uh, so, how, how long does it take to grow? How tall? So it's a millimeter a day in each bone. So the, the bone below the knee and a millimeter a day and the bone above the knee, a millimeter a day. So we can get you six and a quarter inches. Oh my gosh! Six extra inches! Holy oh, crap! Ellie needed like a, a couple, maybe two or three. You know, everyone could use an extra inch. But um, whatever, both you, legs? whatever you want, whatever you want. That seems. But don't you have disproportionately long legs when that happens? Can does it look weird? Um, it depends on what the rest of your body looks like. Three inches, not not so much. If you just do the femurs, which is most common, um, but 
We can go in the opposite direction. If you really want a series one, oh. Cosmo and you can't fit. <laughs> you can, you can, you can, you can make them shorter. Do you have to wear braces on your legs when you do that? Like no, no braces. Time? No, no braces. braces. You just like no. injections. How does that work? It's a rod inside your leg that gets longer. Oh, six inch. I had no idea they could oh. get that much extra. Come, come to Houston. We'll drive some cars and I, I can lengthen your leg. <laughs> <laughs> You'll love and this it. is an I outpatient use a procedure, I'm guessing. Yeah. Is it and we have barbecue. We also have barbecue. <laughs> You've can't. got it all. <laughs> Man. Can you just do one leg? Like if I'm, if I'm on the fence, I don't know if I want to do it or not. Uh, we could. I, it's not. It's inadvisable. Yeah. Uh, okay. But if wow. you have one leg shorter than the other, you can make them even. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess you can yeah, do that's leg right. climbing. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. My, mountain climbing might come in handy. That's <laughs> fascinating. Okay, well, well, back to cars. We were going to talk <laughs> about these Greek cars as well, which I'm fascinated about. Oh, yeah. Well, though that there's not a lot to be fascinated about. I mean, they really are you know, pretty horrible cars. Okay, unfascinate me then. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I've, ha I've had Israeli-built cars, too. It's another country that never should have built cars. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What was that called? The Cicito. The Cicito. The Cicito. The Sabra. The Sabra. Yeah. Sabra. Sabra. Sabra yeah. was the, yeah, it was the Reliant or the, the yeah, the Reliant. Reliant Sabre. It's Ryan Sabre, exactly. Uh, yeah, Reliant Sabre with a with a Ford engine and yeah. uh, a, a ZF gearbox, which you know yeah. most of the ra those things got harvested with their Z. I've had a half dozen sa Sabres, a half dozen uh, uh, the Sabres, and most of them were missing their transmission or had like a Nissan automatic stuck in there or something. Also, only car I can think of that used a cactus as its uh, badge mascot. Yeah, too, yeah, absolutely exciting because that was so, the Sabra is. Uh, it's a prickly cactus fruit that be like a nickname for Israelis. Yeah, but but still uh, still doesn't beat the, the turtle of the Gordon Keebles. So. No, the turtle in a puddle of urine of the Gordon <laughs> Keebles, which is what really makes that badge incredible. Oh yeah, there's a Sabra. Yeah, they were. Uh, yeah, they looked. A, you know, they had that kind of funny face, almost like you know that Daimler Dart. That's a, had a similar that's kind of, of Daimler. Uh, yeah. yeah. Kind well, of at least a Daimler thing. Dart had a, had a Hemi V8, small Hemi V8 in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so so so. So Greece, Greece, Greece has a really kind of a long history of uh, vehicle production, mostly three-wheeled um, agricultural stuff, uh, bus conversions. Uh, there were a lot of people that, there were a fair amount of companies that in the 50s and 60s, they were building uh, cars under license, like the Foldamobile. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, they tried the Foldamobile a couple different times. Uh, there, there's a whole, there's a Why massive. Why did everyone problem. want to build that terrible Foldemobile anyway? Yeah, I right? can't believe but how many know, countries are doing that. Exactly right. They were every, all around, and I, I don't understand it either. But they had a really Foldem? good marketing guy, obviously. So <laughs> the <laughs> Greeks even the Greeks even tried to turn it around once and 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 do it backwards and make put a little pickup bet on it. So um, F U L D A, David. Yeah, oh, Folda. Oh. Folda. Yeah, it was too uh, like. Uh, it's a it German yeah, car. You, you should know yeah. it, by the way. It's a town of Fulda. <laughs> yeah, I, I, all I heard was Fulda Mobile. Yeah, yeah. Our man, uh, our Joni, our friend Joni Eisen, who just wrote something for us, has one of these and is a uh, big, big fan of these things. Very cool. Yeah. yeah so I, I have one. I have one that's even a worse concept, right? I have a, a Reliant Robin that was made under under license in Greece, called the Mavea Robin. So you know, you have that scintillating combination of. Uh, British engineering and Greek manufacturing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what can go wrong? You know, it's the perfect that's combo, right. really. <laughs> Wait, is there a way hey, to look that one up? We got a, uh, uh, David, are you Googling here? here? Yeah, or, it's, what it's basically, it's basically a Reliant Robin with its, its left-hand drive because uh -huh. they bought all the parts. The bodies were made in Greece. It looks just like a Robin. Yeah, there is Mebea, M-E-B-E-A. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It looks like, then you have Namco. You okay, so, Namco so you truck, see right? you see that you see that orange car on the on the left side. Yeah. Oh yeah. Actually, that's a picture I took while I was walking down the street and on an Athens street once. So oh. my car's my car's just like it. Wow. wow, it's perfect. That's fantastically awful. Yeah, and they uh, are really really horrible cars. But um, you know that it's the memories of the car, right? I don't drive it very much, but my daughter and I, my daughter. Before her last year of law school, she did an internship with a Greek law firm. So I went to visit her and we took it on. We, we bought the car in Athens. We put it on a ferry. We drove it <laughs> across the island where, where our house is. And it, it, in, in the 60 kilometers that we drove it from the ferry to our house, 
it overheated eight times. <laughs> and, it, and it was Greek net. It was Greek, Greek election day. So it was national holiday. So everything's closed. But the great thing about the Greeks is they never lock anything. So we would just stop at a closed restaurant, go in the kitchen, get a pitcher of water, pour it in the <laughs> go another what? 10 kilometers. That's so not, that's good to know about Greece because, you know, every yeah. time I've been there, something shut down. So it's good to know the door's open in just case you need something. Yeah, <laughs> just walk in. Everyone's they're there to help you. So we got that. And, uh, you know, in this country, I do, I do have that Namco Pony Super. Namco right. started business as uh, a Greek licensee for Citroën. You're making the Citroën ponies. Right. And uh, then they decided to branch out, design their own. And, and you can tell by looking at this thing, it's, you know, it's, there's not a, not a curve in it anywhere. It's a pretty simple thing. It, those are inter- put- it's confusing because Namco is also the company that developed Pac-Man. So we, if you're Googling yeah. them, you have to be careful. <laughs> totally unrelated. Yeah, that, that red car in the top row is mine. The second one over. Yeah, look at them. Wow. So, that, that looks like, it looks like. This looks like it is in a video game. Like it's not. Yeah, really it does. <laughs> yeah, like low yes. polygon. And it's, it's what is flat twin in there, or is it? A no, no. This is well the original ones that the the plastic body Namco's on the on the Citroen ponies, but this is the Pony Super that was their own design, and they basically mm. built it on a, a European Ford Fiesta platform. So it's a oh. German Ford uh, inline four, a fourteen hundred cc inline Ooh, four. I love this thing. Five speed transmission. So cool. So well, it's so on our then, website. Wait, it's on our website. Wait, there's yeah. one for sale. Wait, don't you? Don't, yeah, yeah, no, we're saying yeah, uh, Don't show anybody. I, I, I got to go after this thing. Let's start <laughs> a bidding war. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. Like, <laughs> three oh. of us are getting geeked out. Okay, I got to head it to Mercedes. She could find anything. You I know what? It, it's got to be sold by now. It's been up for like, you know, three weeks. You know, these hey. Namcos, they're in high demand. They're, they're, hey, they're hot, it, hot, it's, hot. It, it's, my, it's mine. I'll give you a hell of a deal. Nice. Is it still for sale, Myron? Oh yeah. Well, listen, everything's for sale. Sure. Ah, there you go. Right. Like me. All right. Still have a pickup. Okay. And I I will just say for everybody who's listening to this and not seeing it on YouTube, this Namco pony car, it it is like a cyber truck, a miniature version. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's except except for it was actually built. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, hey now. Yeah. Yikes. (laughs) Uh, It's incredibly, it's incredibly, it's just a lot of straight stamp, Flat steel. It's um, the it, wheel arches it, aren't even round. They're they're like that's they're like, it looks half- like a cyber truck. It's like yeah, yeah. It, it, it it's not that far off. But if the it's front so, all tapered down, it would be pretty close. It's so much exactly like what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 right. Exactly. Oh, it's so it's good. a charming little truck though. I bet it's useful. I, I am charmed. I am absolutely yeah, charming. charming. Charming's the word. That's charming. Okay. okay. So we have to ask. Uh, we have to ask about the title, "A Quiet Greatness." Can you, uh, can you tell us um, what's behind that title? That's all, Mark. Yeah. So um, the Japanese people are, you know, very polite for the for the most part. You know, proper, um, good etiquette, good work ethic good ethos, um, and they're relatively quiet as compared to other groups of people. Um, and it's undeniable that the Japanese car manufacturing industry is great. I mean, they, they, started, they started from nothing not all that long ago. You know, if you look at Japan uh, on the map next to China or the United States or, you know, Russia, it's it's small, and yeah, look what they look what they've accomplished. Yep, true. So that you know that's the simple explanation for for the title. I think that that that's great, and, and I think I think one of the biggest accomplishments of the Japanese car industry it's not just these amazing cars; um, it's their manufacturing process, right? Like that is when I think Japanese cars, obviously. I think of all the cars throughout the years, but I also think of, uh, you know, back when I was an, en- an engineer and at Chrysler, we were, we were using processes that were established by Toyota. Um, and um, yeah, did that play, I mean, in your eyes, did that play a big role in, in kind of bringing it, the industry to this greatness that you speak of? Uh, well, sure. I mean, when, whenever you excel at anything, um, whether it's fast or slow, 
you know, it's an overused statement, but the cream always rises to the top, right? So there's a reason that uh, the Japanese succeeded to such a high level. It, you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't fancy advertisements, although they advertised. It, it, you know, it wasn't political. It was simply because their products were so great. And that starts with, you know, the design and the engineering and then all the way down the production line, um, you know, doing it right. And that translates into what happens to the end user when they take the car home, right? So I have, I have a wide array of cars in my collection. On the one end, I have like exotic Italian cars from the 50s, like, you know, Bandini or Asuka or Moretti, super cool cars. Wow. And, then, and then some of the Japanese cars that we've talked about um, from, you know, roughly the same era. And so when I, I, I love the Italian cars, but there's something different about what happens when you sit down and turn the key of the Japanese cars. And the difference is it starts every single time. Right? <laughs> yeah. It starts yeah. every single time. Yeah. And so um, that translates into, you know, an end user experience. There's a reason people, you know, in the United States who have no connection to Japanese culture flocked to buying Japanese cars. There was value. There was engineering uh, that they were pleasing enough to the eye. And they started every single time you turned the key. Yep. So they, they just had it down. Yeah, and and I'd, I'd add the discipline that they had in the way that they came and really kind of conquered the U.S. market, and which is really kind of like the basis of our book. Because, you know, we kept getting Coronas, Corollas, Maximus, things like that. You know, but that doesn't mean that Japan wasn't building like super cool cars. Right. But, you know, again, they kept their discipline of sending the stuff over here because they knew that's what we needed at the time. Right. But, uh, you know, I always kind of joke that uh, the Japanese were kind of like the French with their wine. They kept the best stuff for themselves. And that's really kind of the basis of our book. Uh, good point. Well, Do said. you think that's why maybe Japanese cars haven't quite gotten the collecting respect that they should have had a long time ago just because of sending us the utilitarian stuff and people just weren't exposed or was there more to it? Yeah, no, I, th I think, I think that's a really big part of it. So unless you're like a total geek and digging deep, deep into road and track in the sixties or sports car market, I don't know, sports car market, sports car graphic or yeah. car and driver where you saw like a little thing about a Cosmo or a 2000 GT or something, you really wouldn't know about those cars. Right. I mean, we, we after, you know, World War II, we weren't immediately connected with Japan, right? So we were over here and people were racing in SCCA or whatever they were racing with. Who knew about an Isuzu Belay GTR that in the early 70s, you know, was racing around Japanese circuits? Who knew they were racing? Yeah. Right? Who knew that they were homologated, you know, Mitsubishi, you know, twin cam cars. I, I certainly didn't know. Um, and yeah, maybe every once in a while there was a little hint in the magazine, but largely I don't, I don't think road and track and sports car graphic widely covered, you know, special cars from Japan. So I think, you know, now the world is more connected. Um, you know, we have video games that, you know, different platforms that, you know, young people could race and you could, you could actually buy one of these weird unknown cars. And so there became more familiarity. Um, I think the internet and cell phone has, cell phones has had a lot to do with, you know, when I, when I first started exploring this, nobody knew what a twin cam 240Z was. And now a lot of people in the car hobby do. Sure. So I think, I think Myron and I, our timing was really good to write the book because we're, we didn't start at the very beginning of the wave and right. certainly well, others like did. But the we're, people you're we're talking good, about, oh, sorry, go ahead. We're at a good part of the wave right now. There, there's, there's good momentum for people being interested uh, in all these cars. And I think you're right because I feel like things like video games and animation, like Initial D and things like that, the kids who grew up playing these games and learning about, you know, GTRs and things like that and, 
And uh, all, all of those cars are now old enough where they actually may start to be collectors. But I don't know you would have had that if you didn't have those bits of Japanese pop culture that came to America at that time. It's yeah, it's it's pretty amazing, actually, because they didn't have the advantage of like Germany had Beatles and Porsches and Mercedes coming over right after the war, the 50s and it's really starting to build up. And the Japanese cars never, you know, they they started to come in in little bits, but I guess people just never really considered them that way. That's fascinating. Yeah. Well, we it's, a gener- it's a generational thing, too. You know, it may, folks my age, their parents fought the Germans and the Japanese, right? They, right. they weren't buying German or Japanese That's cars. Right. They, were, they were still buying American cars. So, it, right. it, you know, it's taken some time for that to go through. I should ask, how many vehicles did you guys purchase between the two of you during the writing of this book? <laughs> That's a wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we had we had this discussion when we were in LA, and the problem I mean, was my wa- my my wife was around, so we had to be very careful about the discussion. <laughs> yeah, I was going to stop and and ask Myron if his wife was going to watch this. <laughs> well, and, let me tell you, let me. We had this discussion, and, and Mark can agree or disagree. But as I recall, the conversation was: Mark bought ten, I bought eight. I think that's kind of how we left it. All right. Is that the public facing? <laughs> <laughs> yes. The answer your some, question. Some, we'll leave it some, at that. Something like that. Um, but, you know, um, <laughs> besides being fun, you know, the book, w- whenever you write a book like this, unless you're already an expert, um, which I, I don't think Myron and I were experts and I wouldn't even, I, I won't speak for Myron. I won't say that I'm an expert now. I would say I'm an expert in going through the process of writing a book uh, like this, but I don't know that I'm an expert on, on anything with cars. Um, But you, you learn a lot and you get certain instincts of what's, of what's going on in this sector of the hobby. So as an example, um, it was an expensive experiment, but I bought a Subaru 22 B about a year into about a year into writing this. And that, you know, that turned out to be a good purchase because today I probably wouldn't, wouldn't buy one because of how expensive they've become. Um, but there's a fabulous car that's sort of becoming out of the reach of, of most collectors. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's an incredible car. And uh, it just arrived. I've only driven it once, but um it's sort of the next level up or two levels up from the, from the Pulsar GTIR. I mean, the Pulsar is as fast as, as at 62 years old, it's as fast as I need for a car. And this thing is, is, you know, the two levels up. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, <laughs> it's insane. These are iconic too. Like everybody knows like this Impreza with the big wing in the back. And usually they're in that blue like that's that's one of the icons, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. The, nope. the, tw- the twenty two B B they they've only built four hundred twenty of them in nineteen ninety eight, and it was to sort of celebrate two things: the fortieth anniversary of Subaru, and they won three wor- World Rally Championships in a row. And so they built this car uh, to, to celebrate that special motor just for the car, special body, um, all kinds of cool features you can. You can spray water onto the intercooler from the dash. You know, there's a button for oh, that. Wow. <laughs> you, can, you can change the torque bias as a knob, you know, on the center consult. And cool. on the fly, you can change, you know, these are all important activities for daily living, right? Of course. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> um, but I hate um, commuting without torque bias control. It's not <laughs> right. Oh, That's yeah. right. So, yeah. so uh, these, these, you bought them um, on the internet, you know, you ordered a car and literally they were sold out in like an hour. They made 420 of them. They were pretty expensive at the time, but you know, now they've become, you know, $300,000 plus Oh, no cars kidding. for oh. a Subaru. Yeah. For Jeez. a 22 B. So, I mean, it's the ultimate Subaru. If there's such a thing, you know, I don't know well, if there is now. <laughs> right. Um, but so writing the book, sort of gave Myron and I some insight into the whole playing field, right? If you, if you kind of, if you've kind of looked at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cars and selected the ones that you think are worthy of what you're trying to do in the book, you get sort of a a different perspective than just, you know, kind of sort of knowing about 
specific cars, you know, like this Toyota guys, and that's all they know is Toyota. So that for me, that's been one of the real pleasures of doing the book is that I have, I don't know everything about everything, certainly, but I just kind of have a, a broad view of what's going on in, in the Japanese interesting car world. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's really the, the basis of the book. There, there are whole volumes been written about Miatas and, and Z cars and yeah. things like that. It's, we're not the be all end all of any specific make. Uh, but there's more there than 99.9% of the people uh, would ever need. And it's done beautifully. I mean, it's really beautiful. And we celebrate, we celebrate three and four or $5,000 Miatas just as much as we do the 22B because of their importance and significance and, and the potential for joy that those cars have to offer. That's so utopian of you guys, I got to say. It is. It's, it's a, <laughs> I, would, I would slightly disagree with Myron. Or I <laughs> agree in principle that we're not the be all on, uh, on any one car. Uh, but I would say that we are the be all and end all on the Yamaha and me. Damn it, I knew you were gonna bring that up. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, how is that? So uh, is it, uh, so are, are there, is, it, is this mostly <coughs> Yamaha, Yamaha book and there's a little bit of everything else? Or like no. how, deep did, how deep did you go? There's you need four to, volumes. You need to pull up a picture of the Yamaha and me. Dave, David, we, we went in deeper than anyone else has to this. <laughs> That's <day>. right. That's <laughs> right. I mean, we, we literally have spy photos. We had people roaming oh, around Japan. I know this them. car. I remember <laughs> this thing. This is the, yeah, I've written about this guy. This thing is fantastic. We did a oh, deep dive. What? <laughs> <laughs> I would I, the, the it's the Ferrari F40 looking thing that's like shrunken down. I didn't is know this was real? a big car. Tell us a li- can you tell us a little bit about how this thing exists? Yes, it's like literally half of a uh, of an F40 exactly. Less than half. So good. Yeah. Yeah. So so, so Yamaha. Inside. So so Yamaha has a long standing relationship of working with Toyota specifically. Um, you know, the Yamaha basically assembled the 2000 GT. They've done engine work, a lot of the twin cam work, and pretty much all the early Toyotas was done by Yamaha. Um, my 1600 GT was built by Yamaha. So the SHO at some point, on the Taurus too. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. So, so at some point, they thought that they should build a car with their own name on it. So basically, they took a Daihatsu Opti <laughs> and uh, put and kind of restyled it a little bit. Oh, I love it. A yeah. little bit. Uh, OP, yeah. OPTI, OPTI, uh, David. Opti, okay, yeah. Like, yeah, whoa. which is also a, a wonderful looking little car. I love those. <laughs> These cars, oh my gosh. That is wow. cute. It is amazing. So but, how many of these uh, uh, Yamahas were built? These Ami, Ami, is it? Ami. Ami. Sadly, yeah. not enough. <laughs> yeah, clearly not enough. Myron not, and not I are a- both looking for one. That's right. And, and oh, uh, you don't have one. Yeah, it's rare. When they, when they announced, they said they were going to build 600 initially. Uh, final production is uncertain, but let's just say if all of us on this podcast wanted one, we couldn't find one. Oh, wow. wow. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah. So is it mid engine? Did they actually relocate the drivetrain to the behind the driver's seat? No, <laughs> no, it's just so it's just a, like a K. So the chassis is the same little K class 660 CC. Right. Or some, it's so cool. Like if you meet someone in this car, you're going to have a good time with them. There's no way you're not going to have fun with Look at anybody. the brochure. Look at the oh, brochure. Geez. I mean, they, they built a handful of these things and they have a brochure for it. Yeah. It, we literally have a picture in the book of a guy spotted one making a left turn in Tokyo. <laughs> so it's like one of these you know, under a light. Wow. Oh my, yeah. They're amazing though. Okay, like we the size of that Japanese wing is friends. hilarious. So we did it. We did a deep dive on this car. Oh, fantastic. I take, I take Look, issue I, with what Myron said. I want this book. That's all I know. After hearing so all I. this and seeing these yeah. pictures, uh, I got, I got to get me my hands on the quiet, great, quiet greatness, right? Oh, fantastic. Where quiet they, greatness. Where so can the people web- purchase this? So the website is www.quietgreatness.com. Fantastic. You can, also type in, you can also type in A Quiet Greatness, which is the official title. Both, both of those will take you. Man. We're, not, uh, we're, we're doing it independently. We're not doing Amazon, anything like that. A few stores okay. will Good be carrying it. 
Yeah, yeah, that's great. All right, so that's the so the they should just go right to your website is the best way to get this book. Then it's Quite. really the only way. <laughs> okay, is there a is there a certain is there a limited number of these? Like you know, because well, I'm sure this podcast will make you almost sell out. So how how many uh, how many are there out there? It, um, you know, we print, we're we're selling fewer than a thousand total. Oh, I mean, wow. this is wow. this has been a, a labor of love and. Uh, you know, it's an ever evolving market. So this is kind of, we just, that's the number we decided on. Okay. Well, put me down for one. I'm, I'm in sold done. Myron, let's close the deal right now. (laughs) (laughs) Let me get out my credit card information. (laughs) Hold it up to the screen, (laughs) Bo. That should be fine. (laughs) Take this down real quick. Uh, Oh, great. Thank you. Or just read it out loud for the podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And don't forget the number in the back. Yes. (laughs) Okay. Perfect. Wow, this has been amazing. Uh, yes. I, oh my gosh. Thank you guys. Are you ever out in a lake? Can you come come visit us sometime? Myron's um, been to your collection. Yeah, oh, a few you times. Have. Oh, geez. a few well, times. Next yeah. time you're here, I'd love to uh, to see and show you uh, some of the other weird things we have around here. That's oh yeah. Awesome. Listen, Bo. I'm, I, the weird stuff is we're, we're we're kind of like kindred spirits in a lot of the ways. I I have a car. Um, not the exact car you stone. I have a car called a Bugazi, which you might be. Familiar oh, with. I had a Bugazi. <laughs> Yeah, I remember. You had uh, Evil Knievels, I think. Uh, well, it was, um, oh, geez. Danny Thomas. Danny Thomas's, exactly. Danny Thomas. You got it. Danny, yeah. Uh, good old Danny Thomas. Yeah. I, I regret selling that now. Uh, well. it, it actually had a marble door panel, which made the door so incredibly heavy. And every time what? you shut it, it would like, <laughs> half the panel would come off. It was spectacular. Jason, did I have, did I have my Bugazi when you came by? I don't think I got to see the Bugazi. I'm familiar with them. They're but, uh, yeah. I, I've got owners. the big marble. I've got the big marble door panel. The door literally weighs 300 pounds. Yeah. Oh my. And <laughs> and and what? the the pull hand the pull handle for the door handle is like a marble toilet paper roller that has been like <laughs> spot well. It's it's hilarious. And it's Good a big George like Paris. it's one of those big like 70s era personal cars. So the door is substantial too. Yeah, yeah. It's a 72 Mark IV that's been stretched. Right. I mean the uh, the ashtray for the back passenger for the rear seat is in the back of the front door. I mean that's that's how big those. Oh doors yeah, are. that's right. And it had so the, think about the, the weight of that bar thing. for the back seat too. By the way, you know, oh, there was yeah. a bar. In case you need a Just, drink. So yeah, David, right. just think about the leverage and the amount of weight you're swinging on that thing. You could clip an arm off at the elbow with that door, I bet, if you had to. It's that is cool. inc- amazing. You know, we, we were talking earlier about 3D printing. And, and and the more you talk about these one-off cars, the more I think, how what do you do? If you're, if you're driving in, in one of these, in that um, Yamaha Ami, for example, if you, if you find one. And I don't know, you, you hit something with your elbow and you crack an interior trim piece. Is it the end of the world? Like you're not getting that piece again necessarily, right? What do you, what do you do? How do you replace parts on these vehicles? What do you are you fabricating stuff? Yeah, well, some the um, when I bought my Autex Agato, I bought it at the Bonhams auction in Monterey. Um, then went went back to Greece on vacation. My car was shipped home. My kids decided they wanted to take it up to Detroit for uh, Radwood. So my daughter and her husband and their 110 pound dog piled in before I've ever even, I've never sat in the car. Okay. They drove it a thousand <laughs> miles round trip and they brought it back. And just as they brought it back, um, my, my son-in-law was driving and he snapped the door handle, the inside door handle of the car oh. in, in the Autex Zagato. And uh, you know, you just kind of fabricate and I'm fortunate. I'm sure that you guys are too, to have really good friends who are, you know, kind of like the challenges yeah. and uh we just fabricated a new piece. I mean, we, it took us maybe a day or two. We did it the old-fashioned way, not by 3D printing. My my friend is, you know, in his 70s. We did it the old-fashioned way, but it's uh, almost, uh, you almost can't tell. That's amazing. That's Before, uh, there's one other car I feel like we have to talk about that I believe is in uh, maybe both your collections, the Liata Caballero. <laughs> Let me you stop know. you right there. Let me stop you right there. It is only in one of our collections, and it is not in mine. How do you, how are you missing out on this? This David, oh. you need to see this thing. What so is imagine, this thing? Whoa. Imagine oh, okay. a Chevette. Hey, I, hey I've, I've, I've got a, I've got a picture of, of Mark hugging my car. So yeah, oh. it is. A it wasn't hugging. Base, it was right? CPR. <laughs> 
This is, is yeah. This yeah. is absurd. What the? Is this a it's Ute? The, it's the Bugazi of small pickup trucks. That's right. Yeah, that's it's, exactly it's a, right. It is the yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 brown, the brown car is mine. Um, Ooh, yeah. Show the brown car. So, yeah. yeah so one of, yeah. Perfect background uh, for it too. Yeah. So it was a guy. There was a guy in. I, you know, I I finally call it the finest, the most beautiful car ever built in Post Falls, Idaho, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> there was a guy who had become wealthy by, I don't know, he, he invented like a chicken feeding machine or something like that. <laughs> and he decided he can find real fame and fortune and gainfully employ his four kids by starting a car company. So nice. he's, he, yeah, yeah, genius. <laughs> so th this is kind of what he came up with. Um, it's amazing. So this is yeah. so it's a Chevette chassis. Yeah, Chevette Heavily chassis revived. with... With like loads and loads and loads of Bondo and fiberglass. <laughs> How many of these were made? Too many. Uh, nine, 97, I think. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So were they all pickup style and yours just happens to have like, is that like a cover on the back, like a cap? Yeah, no, it was, it was split. Um, I don't oh, know what, what the actual proportion was, but they made the, they made the pickups and uh, the, uh, the, the sedans. So, okay, for people who are listening in, I should describe this picture, a scaled down 70s Monte Carlo, maybe, kind of kind of design, like very, very 70s looking, like a big upright Lincoln-ish grill and like big sweeping fender lines, but all of it scaled awkwardly into Chevette proportions. And it's a an amazing thing. I can't believe this thing exists. Yeah. I can't and, believe there's and, 87 of them. Well, you know, and, and you know, Mark's going to be disappointed, but uh, I, I did sell mine to another friend who has seven of them. <laughs> well, what, is, so. what is your definition of a friend? <laughs> a, per, a person who would, a person who would give me money for this. Yes. Thing. Wow. Oh my God. And it has the scintillating performance of a Chevette still, I imagine. Correct? Oh, no, it's a, a Chevette with 400 pounds added to it. Mm. <laughs> I've, I've read uh, surveys of the time of people's Chevettes, and that's the most common thing that comes up. They say, w wish it had about an extra 400 pounds on it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Just amazing. Awful. Wow. Oh, that's a right. low note. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good low note to uh, conclude. <laughs> <laughs> this is obviously this is obviously a very uh, a visual podcast in some ways. You know, we were talking about the design of a lot of cars. So if, if you check us out on YouTube, if you want to see screenshots and pictures of these cars, the yes. Utopian YouTube channel. Um, yeah. Or just, or, just buy, or just buy the book. Buy the book. Well, buy the book. I mean, that, that's the better answer. Quite that's greatness. the better answer. Buy the book. And and then if, if you buy the book, you can probably write Myron and he'll send you Polaroids of the Liata Caballero. So you can <laughs> make sure that you, you don't miss out on that part too. Oh, I think it'll be fine. And remember everybody like and subscribe because it's important to us. So on YouTube, do it. If you're uh, Apple Podcasts or CompuServe or whatever else you're listening to your podcasts on, do whatever liking and subscribing buttons they have there. Uh, any of the other housekeeping stuff like that we need to mention, David? Yeah, Do it all. Right. Yeah, just say you like it somehow. Well, just more, most importantly, thank you, Mark and Myron. Uh, this, this was great. Gentlemen, you know, it has been an well, honor and a pleasure to speak with you. And I can't wait to get your book and learn more about uh, Japanese cars. This is fantastic. It really Our is. pleasure. Thanks, Thanks for having so us on. Thank Thanks so much for coming. It's been great. Woohoo!